All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for the webinar this evening. Great to have you with us. Great to have you with us in another of our bi-weekly, once every two weeks, top edit Saturday evening webinar presentations. My name is Gareth Dyke, and this is another presentation today in which we're going to hopefully help you with your English language writing skills. Now, today we're going to be talking about identifying, correcting and editing those common English language mistakes that people make in academic articles. And it sounds a bit boring, but I hope that it will be interesting and informative because in a second language, in a third language, it's often very difficult to understand correct word use, correct grammar use, and get your writing effective. And we're going to talk about why that's important in a minute. So thanks again for joining us. Gareth is my name. Um, maybe many of you already know me from previous top edit presentations, but this is my background. I have worked as an academic researcher. I still write and publish lots of academic papers every year, um, including often in high impact factor journals. But I also work as an editor and as the head of the training department now for our company, Top Edit. So providing training and providing insights and tips and tricks and ideas to help you, especially young researchers, enhance, increase your publication effectiveness, both in writing and publishing your papers in English. And we do this based on our own experience writing papers at Top Edit and editing papers, as you'll see in the presentation today. But also, I can help because I've worked managing academic journals. So I can talk to you and help you with the kinds of issues that academic journals, academic journal editors want to see in successful articles. Those papers that we're going to write, that you're going to write, that eventually get accepted in our target journals to enhance, maximize our career as researchers. So why listen to this presentation? Well, you're probably thinking, why? What's the point in listening to this? We are going to talk about two related aspects of communication in this presentation. Firstly, why English effective communication is so important for us as researchers writing and publishing our own work. And secondly, those mistakes those beastly English mistakes, how you can find them, identify them and correct them in your documents. And we edit at Top Edit hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of papers each week. So we see lots and lots and lots of mistakes. We see lots and lots of great papers. And we see lots and lots of less great academic papers. So from our experience, we'll talk today about some of the common things, some of the common mistakes that our editing team at Top Edit encounter in academic papers, and we're going to help you to understand how not to make those mistakes. You don't have to make the same mistakes that I used to make, that many people make when they write in academic papers. You can learn from other people's experience. You can telescope the many, many years of Top Edit academic editing experience, and you can get on top of effective writing in a quick and effective way. And this is important because, of course, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your perspective, English academic communication is important. Journals want to publish in English. And so one of the most common issues that reviewers, that editors and even readers have, with academic work published in English, is the quality of the writing. For this reason, it's important to get a little bit of training if English is not your first language, or even if English is 
your first language. It's nevertheless important to train. You wouldn't get in a car and just start driving down the road, would you? You talk and learn with an instructor, with somebody who has experience doing this kind of thing already. Journals often write to authors about the quality of the English in their articles. Many thanks for asking whether we'd like to publish your paper. It's good and original, but we can't publish it because the good bits aren't original and the original bits are not good. The English, English content, quality and effectiveness of the English writing in academic papers, one of the most common, if not the most common reason why academic papers get rejected, especially before peer review. So we hope at Top Edit to provide you with some insights and some training in these presentations to help you master English. And in our presentation two weeks ago, maybe you joined us for that, maybe you'd get in touch with our team to get access to a replay of that presentation. We talked about the four commonest issues that journals, that academic journals have with English writing, the issue of plagiarism, tenses and switches, spelling conventions, and the use of inappropriate or confused words in English writing. And so I just want to quickly, in particular, remind you of this issue of academic plagiarism, because it really is absolutely key to understand as an academic researcher. We have lots of content, we have lots of training materials that we can provide you with to help you understand plagiarism, which of course is the inadver inadvertent use of somebody else's previously published text or figures without appropriate citation. Happens all the time in academic writing, especially, unfortunately, when authors are not native English speakers. I do it in my second language. I read something in Hungarian. I think, oh, that sounds great. And then I use it in my own writing the next time I have to put something together. You forget as a second language writer that you've taken text from another source and you often don't cite. And so for this reason, it's particularly crucial for international colleagues, non-native English speaking colleagues to understand the issue of plagiarism and perhaps get your documents checked by us we can help you to make sure that your documents are plagiarism free before you submit them to those international journals. So this is a service that we provide at Top Edit in addition to our editing, language polishing and manuscript writing and translating services. So if this is of interest to you, I encourage you to get in touch with our team, talk about how we can help you bulletproof waterproof your work before submission to that journal to make sure that you don't make the mistakes that often international colleagues make when writing in English. Now, plain English is important in communication and in the way that you write. English, just like your native language, it's much easier to understand, much easier to communicate if you keep it simple. Don't use complicated words. Don't use extra long sentences. Keep it as simple as possible. So you are fortunate as a second or third language writer in English that what makes effective plain English communication is actually very similar to what you would write normally in your native language. And trainers, commentators, people who teach Effective English communication have identified six features that are important in effective English writing. Keeping it short, not using unnecessary words, keeping the words in your text, in your academic papers familiar to the reader, writing if you can in the active voice rather than the passive voice. And I expect that you'll have questions about this. And I should have said at the beginning of this presentation, you can ask questions in the chat box. We will answer your questions at the end of this session. There'll be lots of time for us to answer any questions that you have. But number four on the list 
of the six features of good plain English, active tense rather than passive, style and punctuation, issues that we're going to talk about in more detail in this presentation this evening. Let me just say, though, that if you go and take down an article of one of the leading international journals, Nature or Science, for example, and you have a look at the style that those papers use in the writing, you will find that they are writing in the active voice. We did this, I did this, our team did this, rather than in the passive voice. So that's important to keep in mind. Editors, language editors at the top, international journals want their articles to be accessible to as many people as possible. They want the communication to be effective. And so for that reason, these journals ask authors to write in the active voice. You will see it. If you don't believe me, go and download a paper from Nature. Go and have a look at the way that it's written. There is a reason why editors are putting the English into the form that they do. So you are probably thinking, what are the common English language mistakes that editors at Top Edit often encounter? Well, as we have so much experience editing and dealing with papers in English, we asked our editors to tell us what are the most common mistakes, errors, issues that we find in the English writing of our international colleagues. So we can make this presentation and we can help you guys to not make those mistakes in your own writing, to understand some of the issues that writers have with English. And we're going to cover a number of them in brief in this presentation. If you would like more information or additional training in English writing or additional content dealing specifically with your subject area in the context of writing errors, mistakes, and how to fix them, we will provide you, if you need that help, with specific tailored presentations and content to help you relevant to your particular subject area. So this is a general presentation, and these are the most common issues that editors of which pronoun reference, the use of who versus whom, the use of lay and lie, the use of transition words and subject and verb agreements, pluralization of nouns, pluralization of nouns, the use of commas, its and its, affect and effect, and you can barely hear the difference between the pronunciation of these different um, examples, its and its, affect and effect, right? But we'll come back to these in a minute, so don't worry. Common mistakes that people make. And of course, as we've already talked about, the use of active versus passive voice in your writing. The biggest issue here, of course, is that authors often mix the active and the passive voice up within a single piece of academic writing. But again, this is the context for what we're going to talk about in this presentation, starting with pronouns and moving quickly. Don't worry, it's not going to be long, it's not going to be boring, but this is, I hope, important and useful information for you to look at when you write your next paper. And of course, we will give you a recording of this presentation so you can refer back to the content here. Have a look at it again in your own time. Share it with your colleagues, with your students. Hopefully, our goal at Top Edit is to help you be the best that you can be in your English writing. So this is the context. That's the second page. We're going to jump right in and we're going to start talking about pronoun reference. And you might be thinking, what is he talking about? What is a pronoun referent? Well, just a bit of grammar for you to get you started. Maybe you know this already, but of course, pronouns are used in English to substitute the name of a noun in a sentence so that you don't repeat the said noun. So, for example, here's a sentence that's incorrect below in blue. See if you can spot the mistake. My brother was obese when she 
was younger because of the food choices at home. The pronoun referent in this sentence, of course, is she, but that's not correct because the pronoun should be used in the he form instead of she, as the sentence is referring to the noun brother. And this is a problem for non native speakers often because lots of languages don't have genders in them. Lots of languages, like, for example, Hungarian, doesn't distinguish between the genders of different nouns. So when people come and start to write in English, they make these kinds of writing mistakes. So that's the first one. That's something to think about. Have a think about that. Here are some examples of pronoun reference used correctly in sentences. James was with his mother when the accident happened. The woman was found bathing in her own blood. Jenny is wearing a beautiful diamond necklace, a gift from her husband, James. Isn't that nice? Lovely sentence. But you can see here that the pronoun reference are correct in the right gender to the nouns. And of course, lots of nouns in English don't have genders, but this are specific situations where our editors notice that this is a mistake that people tend to make in English. Moving on then, here's the second one, second most common kind of mistake that non-native writers make, and that's the use of who versus whom in English writing. Both are used in adjective clauses, of course, but don't forget that who should be used when it's the subject of the adjective clause, whereas whom is used as the object of that clause. So let's have a look at some examples. It should sound right, and native speakers don't need to check on these kinds of issues because, of course, it just sounds right or sounds wrong in the sentence. And for this reason, for this reason, it's always a good idea, I find, with my own writing, with my own editing work, to read out your papers, to, to actually read them out in a mirror or to one of your family members or just to yourself to make sure that the sentences make sense. I always do this with editing work, by the way. Finish an editing job, I then read it out to make sure that everything makes sense. Here's some examples of this word usage. The man whom gave me my proposal was my senior. Now that sounds wrong. And it sounds wrong because the adjective clause here should be who instead of whom, as because, of course, this is the subject in the clause. So the sentence should read, the man who gave me the proposal was my senior. And so for this reason, as I've mentioned, give your writing a read out loud when you finish writing the sentences. Here are some examples of correct uses. The woman who is wearing a black suit is a killer. The woman whom we talked to is a killer. So you can see there the subject object of the sentence has been switched around. Whom did you step on? So these are interesting uses of these different sets of phrases in English that we hope will help you when you have to write your next article or indeed your next piece of informal writing. Let's look at lay and lie. And of course, lie has several meanings in English. I can lie. I cannot tell the truth. I can also lie on the ground. In this context, lay is a transitive verb that needs an object after it. So it needs something or someone to receive an action. Whereas lie, in contrast, is an intransitive verb that doesn't need an object. It can stand alone. And we'll see some examples of how this works here on this slide. I lay my book on the counter. I lay, I put down my book on the counter. This country lies between two different mountain ranges. Kazakhstan lies between China and Uzbekistan, for example. The country lies between different mountain ranges. Andrew lays his bag on the table. Can you see the difference in the word use in these sentences? I hope you can. I hope you can hear the differences. Again, if you have questions for us, 
please ask them. And we would be very, very, very happy to talk to you individually about your particular pieces of academic writing so that we can help you, our team can help you to edit and make your writing as good as possible before it goes to that next academic journal. Let's have a look at transitional words, transition words, one of actually the biggest problems that people have anyway in English writing. These are words, ideas or words or phrases even that are used to link ideas and so particularly important in academic writing. We actually use them all the time. In addition, in contrast, moreover, alternatively, also, on the other hand, these are so, so, so common in academic writing. Editors see them very often and edit them very often. Because, for example, you might be contrasting your hypothesis in your article with another hypothesis or your result from your experiment with another result from another experiment. So in contrast to my work, so and so showed X, Y and Z or alternatively to this hypothesis, so and so showed A, B and C. So very common in academic writing. It's important then to think about how you construct your sentences when you put your papers together. We don't want, we don't want too many transitions in a single sentence. It would be better to keep your, your sentences simple, as we've already talked about, not to use unnecessary words and keep the style and punctuation consistent. And don't use multiple transitions in the same sentence. Keep your sentences subject, object, with a single transition. Otherwise, readers get confused. And a generally good writing tip anyway is to think about structuring your articles, the, the sections of your articles, and even the individual sentences within your articles from general information, moving from general information to more specific content. So I might start the discussion section of my paper with general information and then move it down into more specific content. I might start my sentences with general phrases and then transition those general phrases to more specific content. And don't forget, if you have trouble writing academic papers in English, we of course are here to help. And we have a whole training series, Writing and Publishing Bootcamp and that you can join, you can get in touch with our team, you can join this boot camp, you can learn with us the different sections, the different parts of academic writing. We can help you to do it much, much, much more easily. Our methods actually work because lots of people around the world use them all the time. Going back to this issue then of transition words, here are some examples. They say that health is wealth. Hence, it is important to eat the right kind of food and exercise. So where's the transition word in that sentence pair? Hence, of course, is the transition word. It links the two sentences together. I could just write, they say that health is wealth, full stop. It is important to eat the right kinds of food and exercise. But as you can see, and as you can hear, the addition of this transitional word, hence, makes the two phrases much easier to read, makes them flow together, and hence, in this case, reasons back to the prior idea. Vegetables are good for your health. Additionally, fruits that are rich in vitamins and minerals can also keep us healthy. Where's the transition word, additionally, linking the two sentences together? It helps the flow. If you just write boom, boom, boom sentences with no transitional words, then it's much harder for readers to follow. And so one of the things that our editors often add to documents when they're working on their editing jobs, they often find themselves adding these transitional words to help the flow of the different sentence. So this brings me on to the issue of topic sentences 
in academic writing. And as we've already talked about, you want a topic in your sentence, which is then linked potentially to an explanation, either in the next sentence or within the same phrase, within the same sentence. So to be an effective CEO requires certain characteristics. The topic here, of course, is being an effective CEO, and the controlling idea is certain characteristics. There are many possible contributing factors to global warming. The topic, global warming, the controlling idea is contributing factors. Fortune hunters encounter difficulties when exploring shipwrecks. The topic is exploring a shipwreck, and the controlling idea here is many difficulties. Dogs make wonderful pets, don't they? Because they help you to live longer. The topic is dogs make wonderful pets. Of course, the controlling idea is because they help you live longer. It sounds a bit boring, and I'm sure you're thinking, what's he doing? Why is he explaining all of this? But understanding the structure of writing, understanding what goes where, in your English writing is really, 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 really useful because you won't make mistakes. You'll understand what to put in different parts of your sentences and you'll find that your writing becomes much, much easier. Structure, as we talked about in our other presentations before, is absolutely key to being an effective academic writer, to being an effective writer in general. Don't forget the three things that you need to know before you start to write. The message, your audience, that's the target journal, and your structure. If you want to learn more about this um, area, the, the academic writing and structuring, easily structuring academic papers, get in touch with our team. So, transition words. In this case, singular subjects take singular verbs, of course. Plural subjects must take plural verbs. And these are also common errors that people make in their writing. Pluralization of nouns also is confusing, I know, in English. And notice the spelling here of pluralization in the title of this slide. It's one of those numerous examples of a spelling difference between good old British English, which is what I speak, of course, and the language of our friends in America, pluralization of nouns. The plural form of most nouns is, of course, created by simply adding the letter S. But words that end in ch, x, s, or s, like sounds, however, often require an es for the plural. So check this, be aware of this. Hopefully your spell checking software will catch a lot of these kinds of issues but here are some examples of plural forms. And don't forget also that because we've got lots of words in English that come from other languages, like Latin, like Greek, like French, then there may be variants on the pluralization. There may even be variants on the spellings of some words. Hobby, hobbies, box, boxes, boy, boys, lady, ladies, room, rooms, gum, gums, witch, witches, bacterium, bacteria. And probably the most common of all mistakes overall in academic writing, one of the most common errors, don't forget that the word data is always plural. Data is plural. So you can't write data shows, the data show in all of these Cases. I always think when I'm writing, when I'm editing sentences that contain the word data, I substitute the word cows for the word data. So I rerun the sentence, I re speak the sentence to myself out loud with the word cows in the sentence rather than the word data. So the cows show that the experiment was significant. The data show that the experiment was significant. It wouldn't be correct to say the cows shows or the data shows. Keep that in mind. It's a good trick to make sure you don't make mistakes when you put data in your sentences. What about commas? We all know about these little squiggly marks, but of course, a misplaced comma can change the meaning of a whole sentence. For example, let's eat grandma versus let's eat 
grandma. I mean, it's very different meaning, as you can see, depending upon whether or not there's a comma in this short sentence. Of course, the first sentence suggests that we're going to eat grandma, while the second sentence suggests that we're going to have dinner and that I'm inviting her to come to eat. So use the comma properly and don't eat your grandma. You don't want to do that, do you? I mean, come on now. Practical tips for scientific writing. Of course, punctuation can be very confusing. What's the difference, for example, between a colon and a semicolon? Lots of people don't know, so I want to quickly explain it in this presentation. A colon, the double dot, as you can see here, this is used when you want to provide a list, okay? Whereas a semicolon is used to separate two or more related clauses in a sentence. So a colon is used to provide a list, whereas a semicolon separates clauses within a sentence. So I might write a sentence, the results of this experiment were significant, semicolon, the data show that the results um, increase acceleration, for example. It's all part of the same phrase, separated by a semicolon. But a colon gives you the chance to give the reader a list. There are a number of different colored animals in this experiment. Colon, red, yellow, green, and white. So that's the difference. That's how you remember how to use these marks in punctuation. Commas, however, are put into sentences to denote pauses, brief pauses between groups of words. So it's a breathing space, a pause between groups of words. And if you use commas, you have to make sure that your sub clauses link to one another. So in the first place, a comma goes in a sentence to denote a brief pause between groups of words. I will show you the paper about which I was speaking, but it is not as useful as I first thought. Separating sub clauses, have a look at this sentence. The sub clause, in this case, who is in charge of recruiting for the university can be deleted from this sentence, including the commas, without changing the meaning of the sentence. So see how it works. And you've got to make sure that if you use commas to separate subclauses, that that rule follows, that you can take out that particular section of the sentence without altering the meaning of the sentence. Professor Brown who is in charge of recruiting for the university, said that the latest estimates were higher than those for this time last year. So you can see how it works. The sentence also makes sense if it just runs, Professor Brown said that the latest estimates were higher than those for this time last year. And finally, finally, commas are used to separate items in a list with the exception of the last two. So the use of commas here links to the use of colons, as you can see. <clears throat> the following items may be imported duty-free into Azania, a country that I made up, animals, cereals, plants, fruit, trees, legumes, and nuts. So notice in a list, as in this case, the last two items are not separated by commas. So hopefully you can re-listen to this explanation. You can have a look at this um, slide again in the future. This will help you, I hope, with your punctuation in English. Talking about punctuation, speaking about punctuation, here's another one. It's and it's. It's without the apostrophe is an adjective. It, in, in, in contrast, the use of an apostrophe there means that I'm contracting it is, of course. It is a, is a contraction of it is, okay? So it's a bluebird. It is a bluebird. Its wings are blue. So the bird has blue wings. And then thirdly, it's our neighbor's dog. So be very careful about the way that you use these, almost without exception. Unless you wish to imply contraction of it is, then you would use the adjective form in your English writing. So often it's the case, of course, that in formal writing, you don't use contractions. We don't encourage it because the use of contractions imply informal writing. 
in English. Okay, so you wouldn't want to say,、um, "I didn't have the chance to examine the results of this previous experiment in your academic writing." You would expand that because it's formal. You're writing in a more formal way in an academic paper. I did not have the chance to examine the results, the previous results of this experiment. So be careful about contraction use in your writing, and be careful, as we've mentioned, about the word data. Okay, we've already talked about that. I would also say that direct quotes in academic writing should be avoided, unless, of course, you're presenting another author's specific definitions or original. Labels. If you do use direct quotes in your academic papers, then you must you must use them 100% accurately. Even if there's a spelling mistake or a grammatical mistake in the original quote, and this is often the case we find in academic editing, because authors quote from previous papers written by other international colleagues, and there's a mistake in the quotation. So you have to flag that in your writing. That's why people put brackets S I C, close brackets in their writing to paraphrase the writing effectively and concisely. And don't forget, as we've talked about already, in the context of academic plagiarism, it's so important to always properly attribute the sources of all your statements. Don't get caught out inadvertently plagiarizing the work of other colleagues. If in doubt. Cite and give us your articles so that we can check them for you for academic plagiarism before you submit to those international journals. Because you can be sure that the journal will. The journal's going to run the article through Authenticate, through Turnitin, through PlagShare, one of the many software packages that are available to check for academic plagiarism. So you want to make sure that you are totally waterproof. You're totally bulletproof before you submit. And don't forget to read and reread your references. So many people cite articles in their in their academic work that they've not actually read themselves. Consult a textbook. Look at another reference to help you resolve aspects of your paper you don't understand before you start to write. Let's move on to talk about affect and effect. And I hope you can hear the difference between these two words in the way that I pronounce them. Affect is a verb. Effect is a noun. The typhoon has affected a lot of cities in the south. Its effect. Can be felt everywhere. The damages brought by the earthquake will affect the tourism of the town. Can you see the difference? Again, this is one of the reasons why it's so important to read your work out loud before you finish. Before you finish the work, this will help you catch these distinct differences in the word use, in the way that these different words are used. Here's active and passive voice. In case you're confused about what these mean in academic writing, in the active voice, of course, it's the subject doing the action. We are doing the experiment. I am doing the experiment. We collected data. We filled the Bunsen burner. We prepared the research. The passive voice, however, suggests that the subject is the receiver of the action. The CEO announced the reshuffling of positions in the company. Versus the reshuffling of positions in the company has been announced by the CEO. And related to this, of course, which tense to use in each section of your academic article? This is probably one of the most commonly asked questions that we get in our training courses that people ask us about when they're working on their documents. Which tense to use? Simple answer. Use the present tense in the whole of the paper, apart from the materials and methods. This again, I'm sure that you're going to ask lots of questions about this at the end. But this is the simplest way to structure your academic writing. And think about this from the perspective of the reader. The reader is experiencing your work in the present. They're reading your article right now. They're having the experience of reading your academic paper at this moment, so they want to read in the present. You present your 
introduction, you present your results, you present your discussion in the here and now, in the present tense. The materials and methods, however, happened in the past. You did collect the data, you did analyze the data. So that's the only bit of academic writing that can be written effectively in the past tense. The present is, of course, appropriate for accepted facts, background information presented in the introduction. And use it also when you discuss your results and discussion. But when describing your methods, you can use the past tense because, of course, they happened in the past. Here's some basic ideas to help you again with your effective English writing. Avoid those long words, long sentences, and passive tense. We concluded. It can be concluded that is long and ineffective and can be confusing for readers. So be direct, write in the active tense. We conclude, we conclude the results of this study show we collected data. Be active, direct, and that will communicate much more effectively with your readers. One or two maximum complex ideas in one sentence. And we've talked about this in this presentation in a little bit more detail, how you can transition your ideas between two sentences, how you can use linking words in your writing to link different ideas together. Keep those sentences short. And you're very lucky if you're listening to this presentation and Chinese is your native language, because as we've discussed already, effective English writing, very similar to effective writing in your native language, short sentences, simple words. This contrasts very markedly with some other languages, French and Russian, for example, where academic writers are actually told, they're actually told, be complicated, use long sentences with lots of punctuation. If you are complicated, people are going to think that you're clever. That's what people are taught in Russia. Can you believe that? I have friends in Russia who teach academic writing, and that's what they train their students to do. Complicated words, complicated sentences, it's going to make you look good. And so for this reason, when we translate at Top Edit documents from Russian into English for editing purposes, about one third usually of the length gets deleted because there's so many unnecessary words, phrases and punctuation, lots of repetition. That's not going to be the case for you because, of course, your language and English, simple sentences, cutting out unnecessary adjectives, avoiding jargon, using short and simple words, and don't use double negatives. Malaria is not uncommon is an example of a double negative. And again, we can provide you with lots of content, lots of tips, lots of other training materials to help you with this kind of thing. So to finish with, let's just review a few other ideas, practical tips for academic writing. Sentence construction. Don't use long involved sentences and make sure that your paragraphs contain a series of related ideas. Word choice is very, very important. Don't be informal in your writing. Use words that are subject area specific, but that people are gonna understand in the context of that piece of work. I edited recently a document from a colleague in Beijing, a medical document, and it actually said, the government should not let the grass grow under its feet in the context of antimicrobial resistance, because resistance is springing up like mushrooms all over the country. And you can see in that example, several cases where informal word use has been included into an academic sentence. Grass grow under your feet, springing up like mushrooms. These make sense, and we understand what the writer is saying, but these are not appropriate word uses in an academic context. You can use resources, Roger's Thesaurus of English Words and Phrases, a standard dictionary, for example, to make sure your word use is always correct. Your use of pronouns, as we've talked about in this presentation, and making sure that you correctly spell the words that you use 
including the use of correct pluralizations. Many words in English have alternative spellings, and often the difference is between American, the, and British, yay, spellings. In other cases, an apparent misspelling can be a misuse of a word, practice and practice, for example. So again, we can give you lots of resources, lots of help, lots of editing and training to make sure that you don't make these kinds of mistakes, because often authors mix spelling conventions between American and British English in the same document. That's something that often spell checking software will not necessarily catch. And we've discussed in this webinar how to manage the plural form of many words in English. In the case of words that actually have differences, there are many words in English that have the same form in the singular and the plural, and other words are already plural, like people, equipment, right? So these are also things to keep in mind. The use of abstract words, as we've already discussed, and be careful with your use of the present participle, the gerund form in English. After standing in boiling water for an hour, don't forget to examine the flask. What are we talking about? The gerund always ends in ing. And if your sentence is left without a subject, a so-called hanging participle, then the action of the verb gets transferred back to the person taking the action. As in this case, of course, the writer is talking about leaving the flask in boiling water for an hour, but it doesn't read that way, does it, in that particular sentence. Be careful. We can help. We can edit. Our expert team of editors have many, many years of experience working on documents, and it really is worth doing because we have found that getting your work polished before submission, getting your work checked for plagiarism before submission is a relatively low investment, financially speaking, but actually can very, 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 very significantly enhance your chances of acceptance. Because the number one issue that editors and reviewers have with documents is the English. We always ask reviewers, peer reviewers, do not comment on the English. Send us back the paper to the editorial office and tell us to get it edited professionally or ask the authors to get the paper edited professionally. But reviewers almost always do comment on the language and this can be a very common reason for rejection. So let's review what we have discussed in our webinar this evening. Firstly, we talked about English communication, what's important and the key things to remember about keeping it simple using simple and easy to understand words and checking your word use. And in this presentation, I've also reviewed, hopefully in not too boring a way, a number of common English language mistakes that I hope you can look back on. You can review this presentation, you can re-listen to this presentation in the future, and the content of this presentation will help you to be more effective with your writing. Share it with your colleagues, share it with your students, and join us at Top Edit for our academic training and writing program. Thank you for listening. I will hand back over to my colleague, and we will hopefully have lots of time for questions and comments. Hello, Gareth. Did you Hello. receive any questions now? Yeah, we got some questions. Well, yeah, it's good. Thanks okay, very much. Okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, cool. So uh, thanks for the questions. Um, first one, um, are you sure that the present tense should be used in the results section? That's a good question. And the answer is yes, because um, if you think like what you want to say in your results section, you're going to say the results of this study show that the experiment was significant, for example. The results of this study show that rather than the results of this study showed that. You can, of course, use the past tense, but it's more effective to get your message across to use that present tense form. And I would do that. And I would encourage you, actually, to um, 
to have a look at papers that have been written that you use all the time in your field. So articles that other international academics have written in your field um, in high ranking journals and go and have a look at the style that they use for their papers. Because um, I bet you, I bet you that, that um, you'll find that it's more common to do this in higher impact factor journals. And the reason for that is that the higher the impact factor of the journal, the bigger the editorial team at that journal, the more professional editors will have worked on that paper before it goes into production. So have a think, and um, I would encourage you to think about your readers. And readers, as we talked about in the webinar, they're experiencing the article, the reading experience, in the moment, at the present moment. And that's the reason why you use these different forms in the writing itself. <clears throat> Second question, how large a vocabulary is required to write a paper? This is a great question, um, and I don't know the answer to this question. I would say that it depends upon what kind of paper you're going to be writing and also what subject area you're writing the paper in. So, Let's imagine that we're writing a very specific technical article in atmospheric physics, for example. In that case, in a specific subject area, going to a specific subject area journal, the vocabulary will be lower, the, the usage of words will be less than if I were writing a general review article on climate change, for example, that I was going to publish in Nature or in National Geographic magazine. So difficult question to answer, very good question. Um, again, the best advice that we have for young researchers getting started on article writing is to go and have a look at the way that successful international publishing academics write their papers. So you will know who the leading academics are in your particular field. You'll have encountered their work in your literature reviews, you'll have dealt with their work in your writing already. So go and have a look at their papers and see how they do it. See how they structure. See what their vocabulary is like. See what their style is like. Another question is about punctuation at the end of sentences. And we see this a lot in editing work. People finish their sentences with etc. E-T-C. And this is very, very informal in writing and should be avoided in academic papers. So you might have a sentence that says, you know, a range of different experiments have previously been conducted in this area, including X, Y and Z, etc. Right. In the sentence. And editors will delete the etc. and rewrite the sentence so that it makes sense and it finishes as a list so finishes without that comma etc at the end of the sentence we might use this in informal writing we might use this style in email writing or message writing but not in our academic papers and editors will catch that they'll take that out and they'll rework the list they'll rework the sentence so that it makes sense um, question I have about good structure. What is good structure? Will this be covered in the next presentation? When? Well, we have, of course, lots and lots of presentations, lots and lots of video content, lots and lots of webinars. And so if you'd like to access a presentation on writing an academic paper and the structure of an academic paper, our team at Top Edit will get in touch with you. If you get in touch with our um, team, then they will send you information about that kind of content. Because, yeah, like we can give you a presentation on the structure of an academic paper. It's actually quite easy to understand how academic papers are put together. But it's difficult for somebody who's not written very many of them to just understand the structure without training. And that's why online training, webinar training, listening to these kinds of presentations is hopefully useful because we've got lots of experience writing and editing academic papers. Um, that's, that's the questions that I have for now. So um, thank
thank you for them. If you have any further questions or comments, please do um, get in touch. Please do ask them. We have some time left, I think, right? 